Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. When Apollo 13 lifted off on April 11, 1970, NASA was prepared for any number of things to possibly go wrong. But I don't think they had any idea that this mission would later be known as NASA's successful failure. Today we're going to run a loose simulation of the Apollo 13 mission and talk about how it got its rather strange nickname. Now with any Apollo mission, you need to start by launching the Saturn rocket. The Saturn V rocket, to this day, is still the most powerful rocket ever launched. And by the time of Apollo 13, it had already taken four crews of astronauts to the moon and back, including on the famous Apollo 11 mission in which humans landed on the moon for the first time. Our stage one rocket has finished firing its fuel, so we will ignite stage two. There were three astronauts on board Apollo 13, Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert. Lovell was the most experienced astronaut of the three. This would be his fourth space flight. Jack Swigert was a late addition to the crew. Originally, Ken Mattingly was supposed to be in his spot, but Mattingly had been ex exposed to a virus he'd never had before. And he was grounded because NASA was afraid of what would happen if he started showing symptoms up in space with no doctors there to help him. So he was grounded, and Jack Swigert replaced him. Swigert had been training on the backup crew, so he knew what he was doing. Now at this point, the launch escape system can be jettisoned. The launch escape system had one job, and that was if something had gone catastrophically wrong early in the launch, it would have pulled the command module with the three astronauts away from the rest of the rocket to keep them safe. But since we haven't had any big mistakes so far, we can get rid of it. Let's take a look at our flight plan. And, oh, we can get rid of this. That just shows the path of a satellite that I launched on another mission. So right now we're topping out at about 43,000 meters and climbing on our flight plan. On Kerbin, space starts at 70,000 meters, so we'll aim for about 80,000 before cutting the engines off. You can see Kerbin looks a lot like Earth, uh, but measurements are a little are a little different here. A uh, Kerbin day is about 6 hours instead of 24. And the distance to the moon is a lot smaller on Kerbin than on Earth. Alright, uh, 80, all right, 81,000 works. Let's get rid of stage 2. And let's quickly plot a course that will put us in orbit around Kerbin. And we'll talk more about how that works in a little bit here. So it's my periapsis, or my lowest point of the orbit. My apoapsis, that's roughly circular. It's a little off, but it's going to work for what we're doing here. All right, I need to quickly get this rocket into position before I fire the third stage engine. The third stage engine is going to be fired twice, once to put us in orbit around Kerbin, and again to put us on a path to the moon. Let's start now. Take a look at our blue path here. That's our plan, that's, that's the path we will take if we continue to move in the same, at the same speed that we are right now. Now if you look carefully, because we're accelerating and the engine's firing, that blue path is expanding outward. And now we need to talk about how going into orbit works. Let's say I'm standing on Earth and I have a baseball. I take that baseball and I throw it very lightly. It'll go a few yards before it comes back down to Earth. Now let's say, if I'm standing here, I throw that ball a little harder. It's going to go farther before it comes down to Earth because of gravity pulling it down. 
Now let's say I take that ball and I throw it so hard that while gravity is pulling it down to Earth, the ball is traveling so fast that gravity can't pull it down in time for it to hit the ground. Instead, the ball continues to travel. Now gravity is still pulling on it, but the ball never hits the ground because it's traveling so fast. And that's kind of how going into orbit works. It's like throwing a baseball so hard that gravity can't pull it down to Earth fast enough, so the ball can keeps falling and falling and falling around the Earth because the Earth is round, so that, it ne so that the ball never hits the ground. That's a lot like what we're doing with this rocket here. The advantage we have with a rocket is that we can change how fast our cosmic baseball is going by firing the engine in, the engine in different directions. Let's cut that there. Oh, not bad. 79,000, 84,000. That's not quite circular, but it works for me. Now we have to find a way to get to the moon, and you can see the moon is right over here. There's our ship, there's the moon. Now you may be saying, why can't I just point the rocket at the moon and say go? Well, a couple of reasons. First, using our baseball analogy, that's not really how orbital mechanics works because of just the sheer scope of the gravity and the, ob and the size of the objects we're dealing with. It won't work like that. And second, even if I did point right at the moon and go, by the time I get there, the moon's going to be somewhere over here, and I will have missed. So I need to plot a course using what I know about how to orbit objects and where the moon's going to be to calculate how to get there. Now, Mission Control would have been doing this long before the Apollo mission even launched, but I don't have that luxury, so I'm going to have to do it using the tools that the game gives me. So just to take a look at what we're doing here. If I want my baseball or my rocket ship to orbit farther away from Earth, I need to throw it harder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire the engine in the direction I'm traveling, and that will expand my orbit on the opposite side. So watch what happens as I accelerate, accelerate. My orbit around the Earth gets so far out that eventually we encounter the moon. We enter the moon's sphere of influence. The moon's sphere of influence is just a way of saying the place where the gravity of the moon affects the ship more than the gravity of the Earth affects the ship. So we'll aim to get about 50,000 meters above the moon at our lowest point. You can see that the moon is misspelled in the Kerbal system as well, but that's neither here nor there. Now we're going to take advantage of two luxuries the game gives us that the astronauts absolutely did not have. First of all, I don't have enough fuel in the Stage 3 tank to burn the engine long enough to make that maneuver, so I'm going to move some out of the service module. That should be enough. The second thing that we're going to be able to do that the astronauts definitely could not is skip ahead in time. A trip to the moon and back is going to take you about a week using the Saturn V rocket and all the mechanisms involved there. And that number is going to change based on how long you want to stay on the moon when you get there. We don't have a week, so we will be skipping ahead in time a little bit. Alright, no, we don't want to wait 20 minutes, so we will just warp ahead to our next maneuver. Alright, and we are on the side of the Earth where it is night, so we, it is rather dark. Let's finish getting our ship into position to make our next engine burn. And we'll fire the engine when this number right here reads about 31 or 32 seconds. Alright, we are pointed in the right direction. Speed this up a little bit here. And we will 
Go. Now take a look as we're accelerating. The orbit on the other side of the ship is expanding outwards. Remember, this is like throwing that baseball harder, being able to change how fast that baseball is going mid-flight. The astronauts, every time these engines would fire, they would probably probably be feeling a lot of force getting thrown right back in their seat. They'd probably also be being bumped around a lot. The path to the moon is not a smooth one. Or a cheap one, but we won't be getting into the cost of the Apollo program today. All right, we got about 10 more seconds on our burn. We may make some adjustments later. But we'll stick with that for now. Four, three, two, one. A little bit more. All right, let's see how we did. It looks like I'll be approaching the moon. 70,000, 70, about 73,000 meters. Uh, we'll go with that for now. We may adjust that later. But for now, let me go back. I want to move our ship into the sunlight for the next part so you can see what we have to do here. If you are familiar with the Apollo program, you know that you needed a lunar module, something to land on the moon. And if you've ever seen pictures of it, you'll realize that you can't see it here. You might be wondering, where is this lunar module that we're going to use to land on the moon? Uh, short answer, it's hiding, and I will show you where it's hiding as soon as we get into a good position here. Alright, I will eject this fairing here to reveal the lunar module. Designed for two astronauts to land on the moon, equipped with four legs for landing gear. And a ladder for ease of mobility. But of course we won't be needing those just yet. We need what well, the first thing we need to do is we need to assemble our spacecraft here. So I will need to separate the upper part here from the lower part, and we'll talk about what all those parts are in a little bit here. We'll separate those. I need to flip this section around here. And if you get motion sick, I apologize for this next part. I'm going to have to change the camera, and I have no idea how it's going to react here. So here we go. Whoa, okay. Now the astronauts would spend probably an hour on this maneuver in real life, but it won't take us that long. We need to dock our command module with the lunar module. And to do that, we are going to use our RCS thrusters, which are these tiny thrusters here, to make small adjustments so we can bring the docking ports together. I want to be careful. I don't want to go too fast or I'll bump everything out of the way, but too slow and we'll be here forever. The game will help me out here. It's These docking ports are slightly magnetized, which they would not have been. So we'll just make sure I'm lined up here. I'm trying to be careful. I can't just tap left and just move up a little bit. In space, if you decide you want to go one way, you're going to keep going that way until something forces you the other way. So I need to keep making adjustments. Uh-oh. So I need to keep making adjustments so that the ship doesn't fly off into space somewhere else. And there we go. We have docked the command module with the lunar module. We can get rid of our third stage. We won't be needing that anymore. Let's point our ship towards the moon and check out the parts of the Apollo spacecraft proper. All right, let's start with the lunar module. If you're going to land on the moon, you're going to need a ship for that. That's what the lunar module was designed for. Two astronauts land on the moon, do some science, and come back. 
Attached to the lunar module is the command module, where the astronauts will spend most of their time. And the service module. This is not a glorious part of the ship, but it is very important because that's where f the fuel is stored. That's where the engine is. That's where the electrical power is being stored. And did I say oxygen? The oxygen for the astronauts to breathe was also stored there. So the lunar module, command module, and service module, or the LEM, the CM, and the SM. The lunar module and the command module had their own nicknames. On Apollo 13, the lunar module was nicknamed Aquarius, and the command module, we need to rename this to the Odyssey. All right. Lunar module, command module, service module, all set to go. The trip to the moon would take a few days, but we are going to skip past that to the part where disaster strikes.